Hi everyone, my name is Paul Stortz. This presentation is about DriveChain, which is a proposal for a two-way peg enabling Bitcoin sidechains. Sidechains are great for a lot of reasons. You'll see the Block logo in the in the corner of the presentation because I work for Block now and Jeff gave me a lot of time to work on this, so I thought it was the least I could do. Let's put the little logo everywhere, so just ignore it if you don't like that kind of thing. This presentation is going to be about increasing Bitcoin's ability to do things. So in particular, I'm going to answer one question that I get a lot from the technical community, which is, why does my design involve the Bitcoin miners so much? So that's mostly what this is going to be about. So I'm just, these, you don't need to be, you don't need to like read this or anything. This is just, I'm just mentioning that this is Greg Maxwell, Bitcoin genius, and he is, he has picked up on this, that there's a more tightly coupled model where some miners are required to verify the sidechain. That's true. In addition, I have some comments from Bitcoin Wizards, where a lot of people hang out, and this gentleman, Mr. H, is saying that he's not sure that this ma manual corroboration on the part of the miners of the, the chain fidelity or integrity is a starter. The, the, I'm going to argue it's actually quite the reverse. If you don't have something like this around, that's a non-starter, but we'll get into that. Uh, so, in gen the long and short of it is that people do not want the miners to have control over which side chains are, are there or, or not there. But I do, and I would like to explain why my view might be so different from views that are commonly expressed in the technical community. So, here it is in one slide, and I'm going to walk you through this slide. This represents the idea of Bitcoin with five side chains. One, two, three, four, five. So over here I have this row, I have like entities. This would be like the Bitcoin miners, so everyone who does double SHA-256 mining. Over here we've got everyone who does mining on SHA-3. This is fictional, I just made this up. I know there are altcoins that use this though. Uh, and then over here we have random other miners that use MD5. I just Again, this is made up. This is just to show that these are three different groups of people or at least three different accounting groups. And so each of these three groups is represented by this color here. And the Bitcoin miners have two side chains, these little arrows, and these little um, cylinders over here. This group has one Bitcoin side chain, which is this guy. These people have two over here. Okay, so that's that's kind of the setup. These are the entities. These are the rewards that each entity gets per block that they mine. So over here, of course, the Bitcoin miners get a Coinbase transaction, which is currently 25 Bitcoins. It's about to be halved to 12 and a half Bitcoins per block. And they also get the transaction fees from the Bitcoin network. Presumably, they also get either transaction fees or some other kind of payment of some kind from their side chains. And presumably these miners also get some kind of payment from their side chains. So these are little arrows to represent the flow of money in and out of what's going on over here. So in one single slide, it's going to be a problem if what these guys here in red, the side chains, that are mined by the same people and also by other people, these side chains may affect the value of all of this to this entity. And if what they are doing is going to affect these people, then they should have some kind of say in what goes on. And and by effect, I mean that they might affect the purchasing power of these, you know, the, the exchange rate of these coins. They might become less or more valuable. But I also mean that it might affect just the total quantity of stuff received by each entity. So that's the entire point of this presentation is that these people should get a say in stuff that can ruin their line of business. And so the problem, to just make it very clear, is that there's this expectation, in my view, an incorrect expectation, that these smart contracts are additive and that you can just take one and add Y and you end up with what you had before plus Y. And then you can take that and you can add X to it and you end up with what you had before plus X. So this is the expectation that you take something, you add Y, you add X, you end up with something that has Y and X. Uh, and I think that's a little naive. The reality is more ecological than that. 
Uh, you can add y and you can add x and then something can happen and y and x can actually cancel each other out. And I'll explain more about that later. So here are some metaphors for this problem. So one metaphor is an invasive species. We'll be explaining that in a little while. But this is a zebra mussel. They used to live in this tiny Russian lake or something, but now they've spread throughout the entire Great Lakes region of the United States. And I mean, it's good for the zebra mussel, but it's bad for a human being. So you have to decide what you care about. And you can take this concept to an extreme, this idea of a gray goo. Someone builds a tiny little... Um, a very small assembler that copies itself and since it's so small and it's so good at copying and it, it more or less eats anything by design this is a totally fictional this is a fictional construction but in theory once you build this thing it just takes over the world in a few hours and every everyone's dead and there's nothing there's nothing alive on the planet except for these things so again good for them but you have to be mindful of what you're introducing to an environment before I move on to this spam example, let me just explain that. What it is is that you have, a, you have this, this concept of a finite shared resource. So here there's the earth, and, and we need food to survive. So if either we're eating the food or the gray goo is eating it, and, uh, or we're the gray goo is eating us eventually. So over, over here it's a literal atmosphere, but here it's an atmosphere for conversation because you really can't listen to four or five conversations at once. It's just noise. And eventually, if you try to listen to a hundred conversations at once, you can't really hear any of them. It's just really uh, annoying and con consumes this, your, this scarce environment of sound and the scarce environment of attention in your brain. And so this is why even stuff like 4chan, which is like internet anarchy, uh, is, is moderated obsessively for being stuff that's being on topic. So if you add it all together, you get this kind of 1984-esque concept that censorship is expression. If you want to live in a world that has things like uh, Mozart and symphonies and architecture and computers, you're going to have to censor the gray goo character. You cannot have a little of everything. Um, so that's the metaphor for the problem. So restated, we want smart contracts. That's what we all want, right? Or so I thought. And what we want is a contract that enforces itself. We don't need anyone to do anything, right? But even though that was obvious, what's not obvious is that, see, this positive thing is part of the obvious. It was obvious that you don't want it to be the case that someone has to approve the contract. But what isn't obvious is that this permission could be negative. You, you, we, we don't want to be in a position where there are 100 people in a room, and if any one of those 100 people say no, the contract dies. It's much worse than the original position, which is that you needed to go to person number eight for approval. Now any of the 100 people can interfere with the contract, which is exactly what we don't want. So that's just a restatement of what we don't want. Here's another restatement to make it just clear about what I'm complaining about. If we want to have real smart contracts, we can't have permissionless implementation. You can innovate all you want. You can code up something on your own computer and you can test it out and you can argue for it. You can run it on your own computer and you can get other people to run it. But we don't want to be in a situation where anyone can just run anything on the contracts that we already have, which is why I've set up this idea of a barrier which is controlled by the miners, which is a good thing and not a bad thing. Uh, and I'm going to explain, going to try to explain why. Again, what I'm saying is do all the R&D you want in a Turing complete C++ compiler. I mean, I couldn't care less. But if you want to bring it into the environment, you're going to need to pass some barrier. Okay, so over here on the left, we have a good setup where someone builds the alarm clock and brings it over into Bitcoin as a Bitcoin contract. If the alarm clock, for those of you who don't know, it, it basically like starts sending away your money if you don't get out of bed. That's the, in theory. It's kind of, it's mostly a joke, but it's a kind of funny idea. So, and then over here, someone has allowed, this would be sort of like a rootstock or a, an Ethereum. They, they've allowed something across the barrier that, that enables new contracts in here. This is a bad setup, and we're going to get into why that's bad right now. So here's the talk outline. It's going to be in three parts. I've got two examples of cannibalism of the smart contracts harming each other and destroying each other, which is this over here. 
One of those is going to be the destruction of the Oracle contracts, which are, in my view, the entire, really the entire point, 80% to 90% of the entire value add of smart contracts at all. This second example is sort of uh, for fun. It's, this one is quite serious and very legitimate and imminent threat to something important. This one is just kind of me pushing the limits of Turing completeness in particular, and I'm going to steal Bitcoins without knowing the person's private key. And so it's, it's going to be quite a performance. And it's a little outlandish, but it's for demonstration purposes only. So, and then the second part will be some theory on why you didn't even want permissionless implementation actually, because there's nothing you really get out of it. In fact, I'm going to argue that Ethereum and Bitcoin are sort of opposites of each other in a major important way. And then thirdly, it's going to get very theoretical where I'm going to say that Bitcoin, as well as all blockchain projects, is a subset of the field of game theory or not the field of computer science. It's no more computer science than video poker is computer science, in my view. And I'm going to try to explain why I think that that matters for this concept of permissionlessness. So it'll probably be pretty interesting. My guess is it will end up going on for a while, and so just shut the presentation off as soon as you, you can't handle it anymore.